Welcome to Pax Britannica. Episode 34. War and Peace. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I hope everyone had a lovely new year and that they enjoyed the special bonus episodes with David from the Siecla, Thomas from the History of Aotearoa New Zealand, and Alan from the Political History of the United States. They let me take a few weeks off to devote to the thesis and to have a novel thing that's apparently called a break, but I was very happy to get back into the podcast. This week, we're going to briefly cover the end of Charles' involvement in the Thirty Years' War, and catch up on what's been going on outside of the British Isles. Events in London have dominated the last few episodes, and the fledgling English Empire had been far from stagnant over the last few years. Within months of the dissolution of Parliament, Charles signed a peace with France. La Rochelle, the focus of so much blood and treasure, had finally fallen to Cardinal Richelieu in October 1628. The Huguenots would continue to fight until June the following year, but Charles had had enough, and in April 1629, the war against his brother-in-law was over. In November 1630, he came to terms with the Habsburgs too, Charles's three kingdoms now had external peace. But did they enjoy internal harmony? That will be a topic of many future episodes. But first, let's look at the East India Company. We last heard about them back when company investors in Parliament took Buckingham to task for getting paid off. If you recall back to the episode on the East India Company, the company had gone against the spirit and wording of their charter when they assisted the Safavid Shah of Persia, Abbas the Great, in expelling the Portuguese from the island of Hormuz. A significant sum of money was paid to the Duke, which was either a perfectly acceptable payment due to him as Lord Admiral, or a flagrant bribe demanded by Buckingham to allow the company to avoid censure for the attack. The MP investors saw it as the latter, and it was just one of many charges laid at the Duke's feet. Regardless of how it came about, the company was not punished for attacking fellow Europeans, but it also received very little direct reward from these actions. Abbas had promised a share of customs duties from the island in return for the company's assistance, but these payments were rare and far less than promised. The next significant event after the Hormuz attack was another conflict with another European trader. This time, it was the Dutch, with their own East India Company. Now, I still don't know how to actually pronounce the name in Dutch, so we'll call it by its well-known abbreviation, the VOC. The rivalry between the two companies was bloody. They had previously clashed violently over bases in the Spice Islands, particularly the Banda Islands in 1620. But the events of 1623 were far more bloody. The Dutch had suspected that the English were working with the Portuguese and the Japanese to force them off the island of Ambon. More than 20 suspects were arrested and tortured by having a cloth wrapped around their face with water then poured onto it. If that sounds familiar, today we would call that waterboarding, and it apparently simulates the feeling of drowning. Confessing to the charges of treason, 20 men were beheaded, with 10 of them being Englishmen in the employ of the East India Company. Naturally, when news of this reached Europe, London was incensed, and there were demands for either a military response or compensation for the families of the executed men. The Dutch, who were currently fighting for their lives in the Thirty Years' War, remember, ignored these demands, 
they had much bigger problems. It would take more than 30 years for the compensation for the Amboina massacre to be paid out by the Dutch government, after they were defeated in the First Anglo-Dutch War by Cromwell's protectorate. Amboina marked a turning point in the East India Company's policy. Whether it was caused by this explicit and bloody message from the Dutch to stay the hell out of their business, or if it was already in motion when Amboina happened, the EIC changed its focus from the Spice Islands to the Indian mainland. While in hindsight, we obviously know that the company would one day dominate the subcontinent, contemporaries obviously didn't know this, instead they saw the company forced, by the strength of the Dutch, to operate in much less lucrative areas. In other words, where they could trade, not where they wanted to trade. They would still have to contend with Portuguese and Dutch rivalry on the mainland, but the political situation was entirely different. The Europeans were in much weaker positions on the mainland, dealing with the local powers, particularly the grand and incredibly powerful Mughal Empire. In 1626, the company attempted to build a fortification at Armagon, but the project was abandoned in 1632 due to the cost and its vulnerable location, just a few miles north of a Dutch outpost. It was, in the words of one company official, better lost than found. Speaking of cost, in the 1620s and into the 1630s, the company faced serious financial obstacles. In terms of gross profit, investors only received a 12% return between the years 1617 and 1632. Still high, but far below the fortunes that had been made over the previous two decades. Part of the reason for this was that the company had been a victim of its own success. Outgoings were now higher than the early years, as the company had established factories and agents throughout the region to facilitate trade. These cost money to maintain, and many of the agents were flagrantly corrupt. Likewise, trade fleets had grown in size and now needed even more protection to keep them safe. Simply put, the company was overextended. But other reasons were more or less outside of company control, This entire period was one of a trade recession, which particularly hurt Northern Europe. This was only exacerbated by the Thirty Years' War, which of course disrupted trade routes even before Charles' accession and his entry into the conflict. The plague had returned to England in 1625, while at the other end of the trade route, Gujarat, where the company's factory at Surat was based, was facing its own war, and accompanying famine. Conditions became so poor that the company had to move the bulk of its operations from Surat to Masulapatam, which just wasn't as commercially viable as Surat at its peak. Thus, the company downsized during the 1620s, abandoning bases and removing the most corrupt factors to fend off the worst of the recession. They were still profitable, and they survived, But this could have easily spelled the end of the EIC had it been managed worse. The final threat to the company in this period was domestic. Royal attitudes towards the EIC were mixed, as was the effect of royal policy. Both James and Charles saw the company as the valuable source of income that it was, especially when Parliament wasn't behaving and Charles offered to become a shareholder between 1627 and 1631. But the kings repeatedly threatened its success, either deliberately or by an ignorance of economics and trade. Both Charles and his father had seen the income from Eastern trade, and said, if this is just from one company, imagine how much we'd make if we had two. So James granted a charter in 1618 for a Scottish East India Company. The English were horrified and petitioned the king and everyone else they could to have the charter revoked. It took a £20,000 loan to James 
and it should go without saying at this point that the company never saw a penny of that again, but the charter was duly revoked. Charles would follow through on creating a new company later in his reign, and it was a complete disaster that only led to piracy, humiliation, and the EIC left to pick up the pieces. But that's for another episode. The company also faced criticism from a possibly unexpected corner, Parliament. This was surprising to read, considering that Parliament had attacked Buckingham for extorting the company, and the company had many investors in Parliament. But the East India Company was one giant monopoly, and there was significant political, economic, and ideological oppositions to monopolies in Parliament as we've seen. Particular concern was raised about their practice of exporting bullion. If you recall, precious metals were the only product England had that the markets of the East uniformly wanted, and the company had been granted exclusive right to export it. The problem was that economic theory at the time measured the strength of an economy on how much hard currency it had. From this point of view, the EIC was directly harming the wealth of the kingdom for the benefit of a few London investors. To argue against this case, the company brought in a veritable genius of a writer, Thomas Munn. In 1621, Munn comprehensively accounted for the value of exports and imports made by the East India Company, tabulating exactly what the kingdom had lost and what it had gained. The results spoke for themselves. England had saved more than £75,000 from buying spices directly from the East rather than from European middlemen, while for every £100,000 of bullion exported from the country, the kingdom received nearly £500,000 in imports and in reselling goods to Europe. From conversions found in William Dalrymple's new book, The Anarchy, £100,000 then is about £11 million today, and half a million then is about £55 million now. Munn made a point of highlighting that this wealth was not limited to London, and the rest of the kingdom benefited. Lawson, in the East India Company, notes that none of the company's critics had anywhere near this level of detail in their attacks and they didn't have the expertise to counter Munn's arguments. Similar criticism would come again in 1628, and again Munn ably defended the company. As would happen repeatedly, the East India Company fended off its domestic critics, but these occasions reminded the directors that, no matter what happened in the East, the company had to remain plugged into the affairs of state. Threats, even unintentional ones, would come from court and parliament alike, and they had to be responded to. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022, but like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and its bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code RecordedHistory. 
That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com, code Recorded History, Babel Language for Life. Now we return to the New World, and to New England. If you haven't listened to Alan's episode on New England already, then you're doing yourself a disservice, because I'm going to follow on from his recount of events following Standish's raid. What was Standish's raid? Well, you have to listen to that episode to find out, won't you? So, to roughly recap, after Standish's raid, Plymouth was largely secure from Indian attack, as many of their native neighbours retreated in horror at the violence, leaving Massasoit, thank you Alan for the correct pronunciation, and the pilgrims to themselves. More settlers arrived throughout the rest of the decade, but the population remained tiny, never more than 300 before the 1630s. One notable and controversial group of settlers arrived under Thomas Morton. Morton was, in Richard Middleton's words, a lawyer of dubious reputation. He arrived at the head of a group of colonists who settled near Mount Wollaston, where they established a settlement that has apparently been called America's First Woodstock. It had all the decadence and free living of real Woodstock. You know, lewd poetry, dancing around the maypole, alcohol. Absolutely scandalous, I know. At least it was to the pilgrims, who were of course hoping to create a godly society. Woodstock lasted for three years before the pilgrims decided enough was enough, and dispatched Standish and their militia to get rid of them. Morton and his hippies were loaded onto a ship and sent back to England. Morton was just a distraction, though. Plymouth's main concern at this time was financial. While they hadn't travelled to America to make a fortune, they still had backers and investors to pay. And New England had few sources of income. They had fish, and they had furs from the Wampanoag. That was essentially it, and the Wampanoag now found themselves in a much stronger bargaining position with all their competitors fled west. In 1626, the England-based investors decided to sell their shares for a fixed amount, spread over time over nine annual instalments of £200. Now, their land could be divided amongst the pilgrims, boosting their agricultural efficiency but the instalments themselves were still hard to pay. This was, more or less, how life continued in New England, with the small Plymouth colony and Massasoit's Wampanoag Indians coexisting. And then, the Massachusetts Bay Company was formed, and everything changed. The Massachusetts Bay Company, like other companies, was made up of merchants seeking to profit from colonisation and the trade that came with it. Many of the investors in 1629 had been involved in another attempt earlier in the decade to settle Cape Ann, and after the usual gamut of disease, financial loss, and death took its toll, they'd backed off. Clearly, this hadn't put them off the idea as a whole, and the same was true for a few survivors of the earlier attempt who had chosen to remain. Their tenacity, both the investors and the settlers themselves, was partly because they were too not solely there for profit. They were the hotter sort of Protestant. Puritans, though they weren't separatists in the same way that the pilgrims had been. They did not see the Church of England as beyond saving, and I'll refer to them as Puritans for simplicity's sake. The minister John White was one of the leading advocates for the future colony, and despite the setbacks of the last few years, he petitioned the Council for New England to issue another grant of land to a new company. The New England Company for a Plantation in Massachusetts Bay. Once this was done, 100 new colonists were dispatched to join the survivors' settlement in 1628, and in 1629, a further 300 arrived to help contribute to the newly renamed colony of Salem. Yes, that Salem. Fears about the legality of their colony, 
and whether different colonial claims overlapped led to an appeal for a new royal charter. This was duly granted, and the Massachusetts Bay Company was formally incorporated in 1629. There was a very important difference between this charter and other company foundations. There were geographic limits, there was the structure of the company, but the charter of the Massachusetts Bay Company didn't specify where their company headquarters would be based. Normally, this was in London or another South English city, where royal officials could keep an eye on the goings-on, and at least try to influence what was happening across the ocean. But, since the charter didn't ensure this, the directors decided they would base their company in the colony itself. Shareholders that chose not to emigrate were offered a chance to be bought out, but otherwise, the colony would be self-governed, autonomous, only answering to the crown. This was incredibly valuable to the religious dissident colonists, and was potentially quite the oversight for Charles to make. The company elected a Suffolk lawyer, one John Winthrop, to become governor of the colony and to lead the expedition. And in April 1630, Winthrop departed England with more than 700 settlers, the vast majority of them being Puritans. It was at this time that Winthrop gave his most famous sermon, where he predicted that their colony would be as a city upon a hill, the eyes of all people are upon us. Seven or eleven ships, my sources disagree, made their nine-week journey to Cape Anne, and where they docked at Salem. Here, the current governor of Salem, John Endicott, was given his marching orders. Salem now fell under the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and so Winthrop would replace him. Endicott remained as a prominent member of the larger colony, compensated with land, and will return to our story in the future. Salem remained where it was, but Winthrop's party moved on to the mouth of the Charles River. Here, they founded a little settlement called Boston. Boston would very rapidly become the largest settlement in English America, and would remain so until Philadelphia usurps the mantle in the 18th century. We will return to Massachusetts soon, and see how Winthrop and the Puritans settle in and undergo rapid expansion in both population and territory over the next ten years. Moving south, we find Virginia. Now a crown colony, Virginia had been in a state of war with the Powhatan Confederacy since the massacre in 1622, in cooperation with their Indian allies. The Second Anglo-Powhatan War was incredibly bitter and long-lasting. Every year, when supplies allowed, the Virginian militia marched to burn Indian villages and fields, and likewise, unprotected Virginian crops were destroyed by the Powhatan. In 1623, a peace delegation of Indians were poisoned and butchered, and in 1624, a pitched battle was only narrowly avoided. Despite a temporary truce, the violence will continue until 1632. Virginia and New England will both increase in importance as the narrative goes on, but for now, in this period, they were rivalled, or perhaps surpassed in importance, by a scattered collection of small islands in the Caribbean. The English West Indies had begun with the tiny island of St. Christopher, or St. Kitts, in 1624. If you recall, Sir Thomas Warner had founded the colony without any actual legal authority to do so, and with a minuscule settler population of only 16 people. Despite facing a hurricane which destroyed their first harvest, the colony survived to be reinforced and received official approval to exist, as well as claims to the islands of Nevis, Barbados, and Montserrat. Remember this. They also welcomed a sudden visit by French privateers, who settled their own colony on the island, and the two European communities formed an alliance against the native Carib, or Kalinago, population. This alliance was incredibly valuable for the English, 
but not, shall we say, for the natives. Bear in mind that our source, Jean-Baptiste Dutet, a French contemporary writing after the fact, and based on the accounts of the Europeans. Suspicions between the two groups rose until the Carib began to conspire against the Europeans in 1626. Across multiple islands, the leaders of the Kalinago arranged to attack and destroy both French and English settlements on St. Kitts, and the plan was only discovered through the efforts of an Arawak slave of the Kalinago. Again, keep that pinch of salt handy. With their lives in danger, the English and French joined forces and slaughtered the St. Kitts Carib in a devastating night attack. More than a hundred were killed in their beds, and over the course of the night and the aftermath, more than 2,000 Carib were killed. Again, according to Duterte, the Europeans only took a hundred casualties. The bodies were dumped into a nearby river, still called Bloody River to this day. The most attractive Kalinago women were enslaved, and one can only imagine what for, and the survivors were expelled from St. Kitts. The genocide of the Kalinago, and it was a genocide, led to the partition of the island of St. Kitts between the French and English, who signed a treaty agreeing to mutual defence in the face of hostility from the Carib or Spanish and neutrality in any war between their two sovereigns unless their involvement was expressly demanded. This was useful when the relationship between France and England led to war later in the year. St. Kitts served as a base for further colonial expansion in the Caribbean. Over the next few years, the English colonised the islands of the West Indies. Barbados was settled in 1627, the island of Nevis was colonised the following year, and Antigua and Montserrat followed in 1632. Yet again, though, we find the vagaries of geography and the reach of court faction throwing a spanner in the works. Warner had his patent to settle St. Kitts and nearby islands, but within a year this had been replaced by a proprietary charter granted to James Hay, Earl of Carlisle. Straightforward enough. Sucks to be you, Warner, but the king has made his decision, and that's the matter settled. What do you mean Charles has made another grant? Yep, Carlisle received his grant to settle the Caribbean islands on the 2nd of July, 1625. Then, on the 25th of February, 1628, less than three years later, the king granted the Earl of Pembroke the right to colonise the same area, because that isn't confusing at all. The two competing proprietors actually led to violence between the two settler groups, until Charles intervened and decided he'd been right the first time, and the area was Carlisle's to settle. Warner remained in the position of de facto governor even after losing his patent, and played a key role in the growth of the English colony and its spread to the other islands. New colonists continued to arrive at St. Kitts, and it came to the point that previous cordial relations with the French started to break down. English settlers began to move into French-designated areas of the island. It was only with the arrival of another 300 French colonists, and their escort of six ships of the line, which stopped the encroachment. With the matter settled, the French warships left, and then the Spanish arrived. In September 1629, St. Kitts was attacked and ravaged by Don Fadric de Toledo. The colonial authorities submitted, with French colonists expelled to the island of San Martin, and the English to England. But not all the English left. Many fled into the centre of St. Kitts, and once the Spanish departed, they returned. Soon, so did the French, and Governor Warner. He was now made governor in title, as well as fact, and for life. Despite their small geographic size, the West Indies would become the economic powerhouse of the English Empire, and the explosion in their population will be the life support of many a mainland American colony. The West Indies will be the focus of several more episodes in the near future. Before I leave you, there's a link to a short survey in the description of the episode, 
as we're approaching the anniversary of PAX, I wanted to get some input from you, my wonderful listeners, about what you think about the podcast and where you'd like to see it go. It'll only take a few minutes, but I've asked about guest episodes, interviews, ads, Patreon, merchandise, all that stuff. I'd really, really appreciate it if you could follow that link and take five minutes to click through it. It'll do wonders for me to know what everyone else thinks about these things. I have a few ideas and plans in the works for 2020, and it would be nice to have an idea of how they'll be received. I'll post the link on social media too, and I'll keep it live for a few weeks. I also put a poll out for my patrons to take part in, over how I'd handle episode shoutouts from now on. My House of Lords voted on the proposed changes, and I'm pleased to say that the eyes have it. From now on, to keep the sign-off nice and short, only patrons at the rank of Duke and above will be announced every episode, with new patrons and a few randomly chosen earls joining them. So, without further ado, thank you to the Royal Headsman, executed today. Her Grace, the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich. His Grace, the Duke of Clarence, Rory Martin. The Right Honourable Earl of Southampton, Alan Goldstein. The Right Honourable Earl of Bradford, Richard Little. The Right Honourable Earl of Winchester, Alistair Slade. A new Baron, Guillermo Amorim. And a new Viscount, Carl Muscovian. Thanks again to every member of my House of Lords, to Sounds Like an Earful for the music used in today's episode, and to you for listening.